Hello and welcome to the Eco Disturb podcast. Eco Disturb is an interdisciplinary research group funded by the University of Oslo. And between 2021 and 2024, we will be working to map and to challenge Nordic responses to climate change. Climate crisis and loss of nature are among the greatest challenges of our times. Nordic reactions are deeply ambivalent, destruction and recreation, gift, guilt and grace. Recognizing that one of the shortcomings of environmentalism has been its tendency to favor unifying perspectives, the approach of EcoDisturb assumes tension, contradiction and conflict to be the norm rather than the exception. So on the podcast, we'll be talking to scholars, writers, artists and activists whose work in different ways helps to address the ambivalences structuring Nordic responses to climate change. We are your hosts, Gunnar Jemensen, Christian Haugestad, Simon Kotva and Christina Nadeau. Together we form the research group of EcoDisturb. And before we begin introducing our guests today, we'll say a few words about who we are. Gunnar, do you want to go first? Sure. Hi, I'm Gunnar. I am originally a psychologist and now I'm a PhD fellow in this project in, in theology. And my name is Christian and uh, I also have background from psychology and uh, I'm doing my PhD fellowship uh, in psychology as well, studying human responses to climate change and specifically um, climate distress and all these feelings we've got for uh, the changes in the environment. Hi, I'm Christina Nadeau, and I have a background in geosciences and um, and social sciences, and I'm currently studying a PhD in uh, climate, climate, nature, and social tipping points uh, based at the University of Oslo. And I'm Simone. I'm a research fellow on the project working on environmentalism and theology. So today we're excited to welcome our project leader, Professor Marius Tiemann Mjarland at the University of Oslo Faculty of Theology. Marius' primary research is in philosophy and theology, and he's worked extensively on Plato and Kant, Hegel and Søren Kierkegaard. He's the author of numerous books, including The Hidden God and Autopsia. Marius takes an interdisciplinary approach to the philosophy of religion, and is currently involved in two major research projects, one on the life sciences and the other on environmentalism, which he'll be speaking with us today. Marius, thank you so much for joining us for our inaugural episode. So I think I'll kick us off with our first question. I know that ambivalences is a really important concept in the Eco Disturb project, and it features in the Norwegian name of the project itself, Tvisyn på Nordisk Natur. Could you speak more about ambivalences and its significance? Nordic countries, and especially Norway, are often elevated as examples of sustainability, but the reality is quite different, isn't it? Well, I guess uh, it's it's both. So it's uh, that's why we have this ambivalence. Uh, I mean, uh, if you talk to Norwegian people, they're so fond of nature and they love being in nature. And uh, it's almost as if nature is a kind of uh, the, the holy, the sacred space for Norwegian and for, for many Nordic people too. Um, and at the same time, uh, if you look at, uh, at, at the um, uh, consummation uh, and, and the um footprints uh, ecological footprints it's it's so it's so heavy it's so uh, if you look at norway we produce uh, we are an oil nation producing masses of oil and actually our uh, wealth and our uh, way of living is sponsored by by oil production and thus it is also I guess one of the less sustainable parts of the world, in particular in this country here. Could you say more about the, the Norwegian name for the project and how it might be different from ambivalences? Yes, well, that's uh, funny. I, I haven't found an English word for that. It's three, uh, seen a double view, a double view uh, on nature. Uh, and uh, it's it's uh, this ambivalence. It's also uh, there is a particular uh, one or a couple of Norwegian authors who have adopted this kind of 
uh, a double approach uh, to nature and culture uh, when they describe it. Uh, for instance, once describing how to take the first train uh, from Oslo to Eidsvoll, where, where, and, and describing everything he sees there, and uh, which is so beautiful, and at the same time, this this loss, this uh, um, uh, something which has disappeared, a quality of life which has disappeared with the civilization coming with its train, uh, and. And I guess uh, this is a kind of, uh, uh, it's, it's more, I mean, nature as such, it's perhaps not so ambivalent. It's, it's not nature, but it's our view of nature. Uh, so how we perceive nature and how we at the same time uh, construct nature and, and tend to dominate it um, and even destroy it, right? So it's, it's um, uh, Arne Johan Bettelsen has described this, um, in his, his book on the denial of nature and how we sometimes uh, uh, tend to deny that we are nature ourselves and that uh, we value nature very highly in a kind of uh, romantic sense, romantic way. We enjoy being in nature, but we don't see, we have a kind of blind spot when it comes to how we treat nature and how we destroy it. Uh, and 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 he, he even has a kind of psychological theory about that. It's 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 our mother who feeds us, and we we still we, we destroy her, right? So it, it's a it's a kind of a, a psychological uh, mechanism coming in there too. Yes, Could that's be. so interesting. Yeah, thank you. I'd like to hear more about, you mentioned nature, and obviously it's a really contested concept, um, mm. one that we really need a double view on. I love this idea of, it's almost like double vision, sort of a binoc binocular vision on something which is often taken in extreme ways. Either the nature is something that is very pristine, or it's sort of uh, absolutely um, to be dismissed as a category. Um, I'd love to hear more about how you see the concept of nature. Does it have a role, and, and what is its role? No, oh, I mean, that is uh, kind of, that, that's what the whole debate is about, right? Uh, there are philosophers like Tim Morton who deny that we should use this concept at all. So he says, uh, ecology is better off without uh, nature, uh, ecology without nature. Uh, and he claims that uh, it could never do anything but harm to, to, <laughs> to uh, our uh, our environment because it's it's uh, it has such a long history of constructing nature as a kind of flip side of civilization so it's 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 um it's that part of of civilization which we adore and uh, still don't really take seriously or take into consideration um and, and uh, so he's a kind of deconstructive way of, of, of uh, well, crossing out the whole notion. Um, and at this point, I think I simply disagree. I think the notion is too important to just uh, leave it away. <laughs> I think it's, it's better to take it into consideration and, and dig into it, open it up uh, and wrap it and see what comes up uh, when we start looking at that. And I think it also it's kind of important uh, because we have the natural sciences and we have the human sciences and the social sciences. And, and uh, we all have some kind of uh, notion of nature which uh, divide us, but also which we share. So uh, only if we are able to cope with this no notion, could we also communicate with people even outside of academia, I think they, they, they think it's nonsense if you just simply drop the notion. Yes. <laughs> I think this might lead quite nicely into um, some of the thoughts that I know Gunnar has and, and wants to share with you to do with your own discipline and, and the role it plays in this investigation. I mean, theology is quite unusual, really, in, in environmental projects. Gunnar, can I hand it over to you? Yes, that's that's basically what what I was curious about is that this in this interdisciplinary project which brings together philosophy, psychology, biology, and and and, and literary studies as well. There's also theology, and you yourself uh, 
are a professor of, of theology. So I was was wondering what what do you see when when you look at uh, our ecological uh, situation, our ecological quandary through through uh, a theological lens. Uh, I think it's interesting. I often get this kind of question from, from, from people in academia or even outside the academia. Uh, and uh, I seem to tend to look back at the roots of theology and the roots of academia. And I think uh, they often fall together. I think of theology as a very, in itself, a kind of very interdisciplinary uh, field of studies. Uh, and I think... Uh, well, I mean, there are different tendencies. There are, there's a tendency of theology kind of locking up and, and trying to keep its, its borders and defend itself uh, towards uh, all other tendencies in society, as secularization, atheism, whatever. Um, but I think the basic intuition in theology is kind of opening up to all kinds of knowledge, uh, because I guess all kinds of knowledge and science is so relevant for doing good theology. Uh, so we have this uh, this sentence: "Who's who's afraid of philosophy?" And you might ask, "Who's afraid of theology?" Uh, because sometimes you also get the impression uh, outside uh, that that theology is a bit kind of dangerous or narrow or whatever. Uh, but when I start talking to people about what they're doing and even asking some questions about why they're doing what they're doing and what kind of sources they find for their own discipline, we often tend to get into, well, philosophical and theological questions. Uh, and I guess uh, this is also at the basis of uh, my own um, interdisciplinary approach to theology and other uh, academic disciplines, and also my continuous interest in discussing important issues of our time in society, uh, in, in culture, and even in nature uh, across these disciplines, because uh, I guess that's somehow the only way to, to, to um, get deeper into the questions that are raised. And I guess when it comes to ecology, um, the challenges are so big that we are all a bit uh, confused and we don't really know how to proceed. Um, and that means that also people who are not used to talk about um, uh, questions of meaning, questions of uh, uh, how we live together, questions of spirituality, even questions of God. Um, try to ask these questions in new ways, uh, as I see in, in, in many disciplines. And I think uh, theology has much to contribute in these uh, debates, and, and we have at least very, very much to learn. Uh, so, so I'm very happy for uh, having this opportunity and knowing that that the, uh, the University of Oslo is eager to fund this kind of radically interdisciplinary research um, with biology and, and psychology and literature, philosophy. One yeah. critical question uh, that could arise there is, of course, those who claim that Christianity has been in part or maybe mainly responsible for the ecological mess we are in, such as, you know, for example, argued in the seminal article by Lynn White from 1967 called The Historical Roots of the Ecological Crisis. And it's, you know, I would be curious to, to, to hear what, what, what you would say uh, to, to, to that uh, uh, criticism. Uh, also, given just an interesting sort of historical uh, anecdote there, that uh, that Lynn White himself, actually six months before uh, publishing his article, had attended a, a lecture series by the great uh, Islamic uh, scholar Syed Hussein Nasser in uh, Chicago in 1966, mm -hmm. where Nasser argues the exact opposite, namely that the ecological imbalance is actually caused by 
with a secular um, uh, modern uh, mindset that has separated itself from uh, from the sacred, basically. Very, very interesting. I didn't know that. Uh, that uh, um, <laughs> and I guess I tend to agree with Nasser, but uh, I think still White has a point uh, because uh, there is a very kind of a very uh, important interpretation of Christianity, which is also, of course, uh, responsible for for uh, exactly this this development uh, in in modern. Uh, I guess we have to say modern Western culture uh, uh, and and civilization and economy and all that, which is uh, uh, the the has been the driving force in this uh, development and and uh, in the globalization, which is kind of overheating uh, our world. And um, I I can see why. Uh, why white has this approach and this reading of Christianity, because I guess it's kind of uh, very common in his own times and in his own environment in the United States uh, in the 60s. I guess this could even be seen as a kind of main interpretation, uh, defending uh, capitalism uh, against communism, uh, defending uh, wealth and growth uh, against poverty, and of course there is much to say about that. But I mean, interpreting the whole Christianity based on two verses in Genesis chapter one—that's a kind of a short circuit uh, in interpreting this whole tradition. Um, and uh, I would, uh, I would think it's 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 interesting to look at both uh, White and Nasser and and see why they think as they think and confront these uh, perspectives on spiritual traditions, Christianity, Islam, uh, Buddhism. I mean, uh, I guess we need to look at, uh, at these traditions together. Um, but I'm not sure if a modern uh, secular way of life would have some kind of the, the upper hand or be the best option if you could choose. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just going to jump in and, and revisit your point about, um, you know, the interdisciplinary nature of this project and the shared notion of nature and um, about perspectives as well. Um, my main uh, my main question that I had for you really was how how are you finding a balance in this sort of project where um, there are so many different disciplines um, present and so many different researchers with different backgrounds how do you find a balance with this sort of group and how do you um how how will you ultimately kind of combine all of, uh these views together into some sort of cohesive message um in the end of the project that's a very good question and i keep asking myself that question too but i guess it's uh it's uh uh, when, when, when I started asking people for this project, because I had uh, myself an interest in, in going into it, and, and uh, I had many questions uh, which were not possible to to to, to answer uh, in a good way within my own discipline. I guess uh, I also uh, got the response from people who were interested in listening and and getting into discussions which were not narrowly uh, disciplinary questions uh, but my my uh, my my experience from from previously but also now is that this is a kind of you sometimes get lost in translation so it's it's because <laughs> you you always uh, you always have to uh, to not only say what you think but explain how you mean what you think uh, or how how you use this kind of concept uh, in your own field. Um, we, we, we recently had a big uh, debate uh, in the group, and it was even in the newspapers about uh, the notion of climate uh, anxiety um, and uh, solastalgia. Um, and um, the, the discussion was uh, 
going to the core of the issue because uh, Arne Johan Wettlesen was arguing that we uh, need to discover what we have lost in order to defend it, in order to care for, uh, for, for nature and, and for our environment. But then uh, Ulla Akumat, who is a psychologist, he, he, he is kind of a bit more skeptic. He asks, well, what do you mean by this term? What do you mean by anxiety? What is it? so nostalgia? Is it nostalgic, something which is paradise lost or whatever? Uh, and uh, I think it's extremely productive to ask these kind of critical questions uh, concerning what we mean by these terms which we are using. Um, and he says, well, when, when I talk about anxiety, then you need a therapist. You have to enter into a, a room to get some kind of therapy to get healthy again. You're ill, you're sick, you need therapy. But uh, that also means individualizing a problem which is not really individual. It's collective and it's polit political, it's, uh, it's uh, interdisciplinary and it's, it's global. So it, uh, it's, it's uh, well, it might be true that people have anxiety concerning the future or a future collapse or whatever, uh, but it doesn't help very much uh, to go in that direction. People need to get angry. They need to join forces. They need to uh, produce some kind of, of uh, real change. Uh, and I guess uh, this is also about these tipping points, right? So it's, it's, it's about uh, uh, when do you come to the point where, uh, where individual pain is perceived as collective pain and, and also kind of a reason or, or, or uh, you have so many reasons to change that it's really unreasonable to continue the way you do. Uh, and I, I have some, I have thought about this debate uh, since uh, since we're discussing it and have been discussing it, and it's been written in the newspapers. And I think anxiety is a good word. But it's not in the psychological sense. It's more in, in, the, in the sense of uh, uh, the uh, describing this uh, uh, impression that there is a possible collapse. There is anxiety of what we don't know what's going to happen. But uh, uh, it's not something you can treat in, uh, <laughs> with the therapist. You have to, to, to treat it differently, yes. I think you're in uh, one of the very important and interesting discussions that we will be treating <laughs> during this project. And I'm, I'm really glad uh, <laughs> that uh, we have these different perspectives on, uh, on things and especially the topic of uh, climate anxiety, eco-anxiety and... Um, Yes, yeah, seen from a lens uh, of psychologist, the as you say, one of the reasonable <laughs> responses to that would be a therapist, right? So <laughs> I want to expand a bit on on, um, on this regarding interdisciplinarity, and uh, you mentioned it earlier um, that one of the uh, goals of the project as well is uh, is to bring this into into action in some form, but. Uh, Many of these discussions, academic uh, chatter, uh, sometimes it doesn't leave the ivory tower, right? So I wonder whether you have some thoughts about uh, how we can uh, lead these discussions in a productive way so that it can become something that we can uh, use in order to, to meet the challenges of uh, posed by, by climate change um, in a meaningful way. I don't know. It, it's a, it, Difficult question, I know. <laughs> but maybe you have some thoughts. Many thoughts and many ideas. Uh, and still, I guess, uh, much of an academic project will have to take place in the ivory tower, as you, say, as you talk about it. I mean, I hope we're able to communicate. People are giving talks uh, outside of academia. They're writing in newspapers. They are discussing with politicians. So it's, things are happening all the time. Uh, and I think it's, it has uh, kind of um, 
many influences, but um, I have been encouraged by uh, the contact we had with some of the the, the organizations, uh, ecological engagement among young people, um, uh, nature and youth, um, YMCA Global, they have their several groups and they join this uh, Fridays for Future and so on. And after COVID, I hope they will get back into the streets. I think they are on their way back. Um, and they really are interested in having uh, some information, some discussions, uh, what is really possible to do, what is happening. If you, if you look at it from the academic perspective, how can we get more knowledge about it and how can we react in a sensible way? Uh, and I mean, Christina and I we were at the Climate House talking about this and the Climate House is, is made for uh, people between 16 and 18, but also of course, there are many older people coming and younger people. And I guess we, we hope that this, the discussions we have will be uh, relevant for many people and, and somehow contribute to the change of, of, of society. But still, it's, it's, uh, it's always a difficult question, as you say. <laughs> Um, I would just want, uh, yes, I, I just want to follow up with what you said um, in terms of just my personal experience with uh, interdisciplinary work. Um, one of the great joys I find in it is the fact that we, um, when speaking to other researchers from um, other backgrounds, we find that often we're speaking about the same thing, but using different language to address it. Um, so um, perhaps this project is a way to kind of unify this message, which has a, um, a lot of different backings to it, like scientific backgrounds or literature backgrounds, and unifying that message in order to, to have a more co cohesive ultimate message to send out to the public, because I think a lot of people just get confused a lot of the time with uh, the academic research surrounding climate change. And um, do you find that as well when you speak with other people, that if you dig down enough, we're lots of the time we're addressing the same issues, but just um, just need some time to understand each other. I guess yes and no. <laughs> I, I guess it's, it's uh, there is a kind of, we address many of the same issues and we come to the same uh, nerve of something uh, which is important for us, but uh, it's, it doesn't always hurt in the same way, so to speak. So it's, 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 uh, and this is, uh, this is, uh, what we dig into or delve into when we uh, we think of uh, where we address the tensions and the contradictions and the conflicts perhaps more than than the unifying perspectives and still this is how we join forces i guess uh, not by kind of having uh, only a clear message i guess that is might be more the the work of the politicians and and, and the activists uh, and we uh, for instance, as Uli Jakob Matsen did, he, he asked some skeptical questions. And that is kind of productive for proceeding in, in knowledge too. Yes. But I, 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 I guess I agree and, and uh, I disagree. <laughs> I think anyway, it's, it's wonderful that the humanities and theology are brought into dialogue with, uh, with the natural sciences on this, on this question, because I mean, uh, the, the whole ecological challenge has been framed through a natural science lens for the last few decades. But actually before, before those ana analyses were made, you know, the IPCC and so forth, actually it was the humanities and theology that uh, also brought uh, the challenge of uh, how uh, we uh, our humans are treating nature. Like when we when we weren't caught in this sort of CO2 fundamentalism, you could say that everything is about CO2 and carbon emission and so forth. That is a very sort of technological scientific lens to view the situation through. Actually, uh, the the earlier uh, writings on on, the, on this uh, burgeoning crisis, you know, in the in the 60s, for instance, uh, many of them uh, 60s and 70s also, you know, uh, looking to RNS, for instance, who is one of the most famous Norwegians internationally uh, mm -hmm. writing on, on, on deep ecology, actually in the wake also of, uh, you know, Lynn White and, and so forth. So um, I think it's essential that, uh, that the humanities, theology uh, are brought into the picture because in the media, it's all, you know, most of the time portrayed as a, as a merely 
natural science issue. So I, I actually wanted to circle back to the, the question of theology uh, for a moment. You know, we, we, we're fortunate to have you here, Marius, to, to be able to, uh, to kind of uh, pick your brain on, on, on that dimension of this larger project. And, uh, and, you know, after the la latest IPCC report was released, I think myself and many were kind of caught by some kind of uh, helplessness and, 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 and darkness, a kind of darkening of, of uh, one's uh, consciousness, you know, is it, will we, will we be able to turn this thing around somehow? This is a, this is a question that is coming up a lot and, and you know we have to do this and this and this in the next 10 years or else there might be catastrophic consequences and that there's there's something about that narrative that uh, you know brings up you know some kind of apocalyptic feelings uh, something that perhaps resonates deeply in a, in a kind of uh, deeper stratum of the collective psyche perhaps uh, influenced by uh, Christianity uh, that's just an idea I had and I, I was wondering what your what your thoughts are on some like the biblical and Christian themes uh, playing out in this uh, situation yes I know uh, Christianity is uh, full of apocalyptic movements at least uh, many of them have been uh, catastrophic and they have also some some of them have also produced disasters or cat catastrophes uh, by their own uh, political actions so it's uh, 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 I guess it's it's uh, it's easy to get I, I think it's not strange that these apocalyptic visions, are returning now. I think they belong to a kind of, it's belong to, to, to Christianity and other religions, but it also belongs to a kind of a cultural narrative, which is there for us when, uh, the, when the entire situation is getting confused and, and threatening. So it's, I think one of the important things about, um, about uh, a long tradition like the Christian tradition and, and uh, with its many experiences with nature, with culture and with politics and religion uh, is, um, is that the dark uh, uh, prospects and expectations uh, do not necessarily uh, exclude the hope uh, and the and sometimes even the the the, the despair and the, and the darkness yeah, are making space for a more radical hope which is not necessarily a kind of uh passivating or uh, kind of uh you i mean there is there is hope which is simply opium for the people uh, which is uh, the, the the critique of marxism right but i think there is a, a stronger tendency for instance eschatology uh, eschatology is is a way of dealing with both uh, and keeping uh, hope faith in a period of uh, of despair and of the uh, apocalypse which is I guess also one of the basic narratives of Hollywood, for instance. So it's uh, <laughs> it's how uh, there is always a hope, always a possibility, and I think uh, it's important to look for these options, uh, not necessarily as a Hollywood film, but uh, as a kind of realistic hope, uh, which is, I guess, more motivating that than the the the, the total apocalypse, uh, which you have in some some of the uh, uh, eco uh, narratives and the uh, uh, cli-fi, also the climate fiction, uh, which we also study in this project. 
Uh, yes, I just wanted to um, to highlight the fact that you spoke about you know this confusion and this kind of threatening theme when it comes to um, apocalypse, and we we see this reflected also in in the natural sciences as well. And, and I think that's perhaps where we're trying to find this balance, especially when focusing on tipping points. This idea of the unknown and the um, the domino effect of things getting worse and worse. Uh, so um, again, um, kind of looking back at how. Uh, we can balance that. Uh, we see um, we see the, uh, the climate tipping points as like trying to drive the um, the narrative of you know we need to do something quickly otherwise all will be lost. Um, versus uh, I, I don't necessarily think that the balance is there in the natural sciences, but uh, uh, the motivation uh, needs to be addressed certainly in this conversation. Yeah. And I, I guess uh, the whole debate needs to be continuously informed by the natural science because that's the way we have uh, the, the best basis we have for knowledge on this issue. <laughs> so it's, and, and this information, I mean, it's, it's, it's collected by so many excellent scientists worldwide. And, and I mean, only the way they are cooperating to 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 get access to this knowledge and 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 get kind of basis for political decisions i think that is is uh, both impressive and gives some reason for hope too uh, and i i think we've seen in the last uh, three to four years kind of change in public opinion where this is not any longer a question if or whatever or when maybe uh, it's it's a question of yes we have to do something we have to do some big changes uh, uh, the question is rather how quickly are we able to do these changes to 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 to, to make this shift both of attitude to political uh, strategies uh, energy uh, i mean there are many changes which have to happen at the same time uh, and um, but I, I'm I also see that there are many scientists who invite uh, scholars from social social sciences and, and humanities because uh, they see and we see that we need uh, the sources of interpretation in order to be able to to convert this knowledge into action uh, and changes, right? Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'd like to return to this notion that you brought up of realistic hope, which I thought was a really striking phrase, the realism of hope. And I'd like to ask you more about that. It strikes me that you're talking about a kind of critical realism of hope, that it's not hope that's the problem, but it's how we hope. That without any hope, there isn't a possibility for kind of pragmatic action. Um, and yeah, I'd like to know more about what you see as a kind of the modality of hope. Um, I'm also reminded of what the theologian Catherine Keller has written about, specifically the apocalypse, saying that it's a really important form of like discourse because even though uh, the environmental crisis doesn't uh, doesn't entail the end of the world, it entails the end of a kind of world, a mode of living in the world, which is is the the current one. Yeah, what are your thoughts on the sort of the critical realism of hope and the modality of hope? I mean, hope is, it's, it's a con con concept, a uh, complex concept, uh, and it's, it's uh, very closely connected to temporality. So how, how, uh, how we understand time and how we understand expectations uh, and our future. And, and I guess that is uh, where um, hope and despair and anxiety meet in these uh, questions about possibilities, future, uh, uh, which which is always uh, somehow unknown uh, to, to most of us. And uh, I guess hope is, uh, you could distinguish between uh, the, the question came up with the individual, uh, anxiety, individual hope, and the collective hope, which is for uh, for, the, for our common future, so to speak, right? Um, and I guess these have been kind of 
rather different, in particular within the Christian tradition. It's, it's been often connected to the uh, individual existential hope. And I think that's also part of the interpretation which you have then in, in psychology. You have to somehow so, uh, produce a hope uh, or reproduce it uh, in order to make meaning uh, within uh, the life of a human being. Uh, and I guess the situation on this uh, global scope and, and what happens to humanity, what happens to, to our planet, it's uh, it's different because it's uh, it's it's uh, somehow uh, total. It's about a way of life, as you say, and 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 in in that connection, it's it's uh, the tension between uh, having a realistic view of uh, what really goes on, what happens, what is continuously now destroyed uh, under our feet and in our surroundings and uh, looking for possibilities, looking for opportunities for different ways of life. So I think it has to be kind of radically different from what we used to uh, because we tend to long for uh, for uh, the paradise which we had. I think it won't return. So what we're going to experience in the future is going to be different. Uh, but I, I guess uh, 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 the, the, the source of hope, which I really uh, connect to the other virtues of, of, uh, of having faith, having experiencing love, uh, not only for human beings, but for nature, you can say, other, other species too, uh, is... Uh, making it, uh, giving sense to, to a kind of a, a form of life, uh, which is uh, not full of despair, but full of oh, open to the future that might come. I'm sorry, there's some lightning and thunder outside my, my window here. <laughs> I guess it's, it's a signal, it's a sign. <laughs> Yeah, I, I I liked uh, I, I I liked your formulation of hope, and I I, I attached myself to something else uh, than than Simone. I I heard you say a more radical hope, and 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 I was thinking that you know this the way in which the ecological crisis, the ecological doom, somehow is portrayed is almost like a secularization of the old. Uh, apocalyptic theme it's like it's made totally imminent like we we have we, we we we're creating an imminent trying to create an imminent vision of what uh utopia will be like sort of on the other side of this with with you know um teslas and 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 renewable energy and uh or sustainable farming and and and, and these kinds of things and so it's uh, but but what i'm hearing you're saying is that there there is a radical hope that goes deeper than any of these sort of purely imminent visions of what what uh, ideal life on this planet could be yeah exactly and i i and that's uh, for me also kind of uh um i actually have discussed this issue of hope with some american colleagues especially under trump they were so full of despair and they were talking about uh, hope as a kind of a duty or a, a discipline, something you had to, to practice and, and, and be good at doing uh, every day because it was so difficult uh, uh, in dark times. Uh, and I can understand that perspective and I think it might, it might be necessary to, to, to have it as a kind of discipline. But behind that, that disciplinary hope, I, I, I look for, for uh, hope as a gift, as a kind of uh, unconditional gift, uh, which is, which is, uh, I guess, uh, what you would mention, call a radical hope, uh, moving beyond the perspectives we are able to to see uh, within our uh, limits. Yes, uh, and for me, it remains uh, hope remains every day a kind of such uh, a gift, uh, which I'm looking for and and tend to discover somewhere. Thank you so much for that conversation, Marius. You've given us lots to think about, and especially that 
the, the last kind of phenomenology of hope. Really, really amazing. Thank you so much. And it now only remains to thank my co-hosts, Christian, Christine and Gunnar, and also you, the listeners, for tuning into our inaugural episode of the Eco Disturb podcast. So Eco Disturb is funded by the University of Oslo, and you can get regular updates about our activities by following us on Twitter at Eco Disturb. And you can also subscribe to our YouTube channel where we'll be putting up the episodes of podcasts.